Um, I think it should be a lot of fun. Uh, right, so the first thing I'd like to do is write down a couple of buzzwords from my uh, title. And, and then on the other side, I guess we have uh, Gromov and the moon. And so what I'd like to do in, in this talk is, is, is connect these two seemingly uh, disparate subjects. Um, and actually, as it turns out, this is kind of a, a, a not uncommon feature of symplectic geometry, I think, as a whole, where rather interesting, if not profound, results uh, can be um, discovered, essentially, by connecting rather disparate subjects. And so this is sort of an example of that. Um, so for the most part, I want to sort of tell the story of how we sort of connect, and really what, we're not connecting Gromov, but rather Gromov's work with pseudo-homomorphic curves and symplectic manifolds with not the moon, but the uh, a certain class of restricted three-body problems. Right? So these are sort of the two subjects that I'd like to connect. Um, and so, right, so the most of the talk is then going to be a story, um, uh, the story of that connection. And towards the very end, uh, I'll be able to sort of uh, add my contributions uh, or, or uh, explain my contributions, but uh, that won't occur at the end, as I think uh, really the story here is kind of the interesting part, um, but uh, uh, perhaps room for discussion towards the end um, about future results. Good. So let's start with uh, let's start with the target here, which is a class of restricted three-body problems. So, so we start with the three-body problem, which is what. So hopefully we, we recall you have three points in space, e and each one has mass. And because it has mass, it has a gravitational field. And you want to understand the dynamics of these three particles, which are governed by the classical mechanics associated to their uh, gravitational fields. Now, this problem is sort of too complicated, so we want to restrict it down a bit. And unfortunately, you restrict it so much that it boils down to this terrible acronym, which is the regularized planar circular restricted three-body problem. So it's a lot of letters. Uh, so I think we can explain that best with a, with a picture. So if we think about the three-body problem to start, we have, say, one massive primary here, and a, maybe a smaller massive primary here, and a smaller massive, pri or smaller massive primary elsewhere. So now the restricted, right, that would be the three-body problem. The restricted three-body problem then says, well, let's understand what happens as the mass of that smallest particle actually goes to zero, right? So heuristically, then, what you're thinking of is this, the, the most massive particle here is being, say, for instance, the Earth, a smaller massive primary is being the moon, and then this being some sort of dust particle. This actually is a good approximation to the problem. In fact, another good approximation to the problem is replacing this thing with a dust particle with just, say, for instance, a uh, satellite or, uh, or, or a shuttle even. The masses are sort of sufficient that this is, in fact, a good approximation. So, right, so then we have the word circular here. So now these two massive particles, well, they have a, at any uh, point in time, they have a, a, a corresponding center of mass. And as it turns out, because the smallest particle has no mass, it exerts no influence on the other two primaries, and so therefore the the three-body problem here, let's see, these two points then solve, in fact, a two-body problem, and they orbit around each other on Kepler ellipses. And the circular condition is going to demand, that, in fact, that they orbit around their common center of mass along circles. So here maybe is the trajectory of the Earth and Moon. And now what we want to do is, now what we want to do, since we know exactly how the behavior of the Earth and the Moon, we want to understand the dynamics of the small massless particle. And the planar condition sort of says, well, really, you're working in three space, but it's also the case that, that the Earth and the Moon, they travel, they orbit around each other in a single plane of motion, and we want to assume that that massless particle travels in that same plane of motion. That's the planar condition. And then this last, this last term here, R, is, uh, is for regularization. And you see, both in the real world and for this idealized system, we have this problem that our small satellite could crash into one of our planets. And this would be, well, a discontinuity in the system, which we don't like. So we need a good way to model this. And so this will be modeled by regularizing the problem, which is essentially just, um, heuristically, we can think of it as if a particle, if our, if our particle, which we want to understand the dynamics of, which might look, say, something like this for a particular trajectory, if it happens to crash into one of our two massive primaries, we want to assume that it actually has a hard collision and bounces off. So in finite time, it hits the, it hits the, uh, the massive primary, and then instantaneously, sort of an instantaneously, uh, um, or an instant later, its momentum reverses and it bounces off. And this actually ends up being a good approximation to the problem, uh, as we can see, both heuristically and, uh, and mathematically, but we'll get to that. And so then we say, okay, well, well what might our goal be then? Well, our, our goal then is to find... Could you model those planets as spheres? Or no points. 
points for this problem. So now what we want to do is, uh, is find, and by find I mean prove the existence of, periodic orbits and other dynamical structures. So dynamical structures for us, as we'll see, are going to be uh, services, global services of section. And I have the word periodic here in quotes because, as we'll see in just a minute, we're not really interested in periodic orbits in this inertial reference frame, but we want to switch to a, a rotating reference frame where it looks like the Earth and the Moon are stationary, and we want to understand periodic orbits in this reference frame. Right? But uh, that will come in a second. OK, so, so that's our goal. And on the, other, on the other side here, we have Gromov. And I think it's fairly safe to say that in 85, Gromov has a, has a rather seminal paper in which he, uh, I think it's fair to say, invents modern symplectic geometry. So since I meant this to be a fairly, um, a talk for a, a fairly wide audience, I think it's fair to uh, spend at least a second to recall what a symplectic manifold is. So for our purposes, actually, we want to think of this manifold as just being four dimensions. But in general, it could be sort of even dimensions, right? Um, and then omega is going to be this closed, uh, well, it's going to be a two-form on M, uh, which is closed and non-degenerate. Um, and given this, Gromov says, well, we need to consider almost complex structures. Right, which is, uh, well, really, it's a, it's a smooth section of an endomorphism bundle, which satisfies j compose j equals minus the identity. So what's this mean? We have an even dimensional manifold. You pick a point in that manifold, pick a vector at that point, and then you apply this almost complex structure. Locally, it's just a linear map. And what the almost complex stru structure does is it gives you a preferred 90 degree, 90 degree rotation of that vector. And in particular, if you apply, the almost, you apply the almost complex structure again, you get minus the vector that you started with. Right? So that's this condition right here. So now this is an almost complex structure. I mean, you, you know, uh, a natural thing to think about is then multiplication by i in a complex manifold, where you think of the complex manifold as, in fact, as a, as a real manifold instead. So this would be an example, but I do want to emphasize the word almost, which is meant to convey the point that this almost complex structure doesn't have to be induced from local complex coordinates, right? Uh, that would only be true if the nine house tensor, tensor vanishes locally, which in general need not be the case. So now Gromov says, okay, well, we can have manifolds with almost complex structures, and we can also have symplectic manifolds. So we kind of want to combine the two ideas, and we want to put a slight restriction, well, an important but slight restriction on our almost complex structure J, and we want to assume that J is omega tame. So that means that if you look at omega applied to v comma jv, that this has to be bigger than or equal to norm v squared for some Ramanian metric on your ambient manifold. So this is a tameness condition. So I'm going to put a little star here and tell you why that's important in just a second. To tell you why it's important, we have to introduce the other fundamental idea from Gromov's 85 paper, which is the notion of a pseudo-holomorphic curve. So a pseudo-holomorphic curve, well, you start with the Riemann surface. So this will be a, a Riemann surface, sigma with j. And a, a Riemann surface is nothing more than a closed, complex, one-dimensional manifold. Or if you're comfortable with the uniformization theorem, you, you're uh, uh, perfectly allowed to, to think of this as just a closed, real, two-dimensional manifold with a smooth, almost complex structure on it. And then what you do is you consider a map u from this Riemann surface into an almost complex manifold with a property that the derivative of your map intertwines the almost complex structures on, on the target and domain. OK. So now, this turns out to be, I don't have anywhere to write this, but an elliptic partial differential equation. So, if, yeah, if you, haven't, uh, if you haven't thought about pseudo-holomorphic curves before, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about them for a, for a second. Um, I think a good way to think about them is rather than consider the map 
think of its image as a submanifold. And the idea is that as a submanifold, it's real two-dimensional as a submanifold, and so it has tangent planes, and its tangent planes are invariant under the action of the almost complex structure. So in some sense, you're thinking of something like, let's see, something like real two-dimensional submanifolds, which are, in some sense, holomorphic submanifolds. Right? A natural example would be to say, well, suppose, suppose that your almost complex structure is actually a complex structure, so that your target manifold is a complex manifold, and then really you're just talking about holomorphic, complex one-dimensional holomorphic submanifolds. Right? But of course, they can have singularities and nodes and some other, uh, some other things. So submanifold might not be the, uh, the best description, but, but that's a good, a good way to, uh, to at least start. But the important thing to realize is that the important thing to realize is that this is an elliptic partial differential equation, which generalizes ideas, say, from algebraic geometry, right? And, and let's see. Mm. Let me back up. Let me back up just, just a second to mention that so pseudo-holomorphic curves, uh, and in general pseudo-holomorphic maps, satisfy a lot of properties, and there's a lot of different ways that one might think of them. So again, of course you can think of these things as, as complex one-dimensional sub-varieties in complex manifolds, but you can also think of them as minimal surfaces, or harmonic maps, or calibrated geometries. So there's a lot of different ways that one, a lot of different tools that one might bring to bear on, on, on the study of pseudo-holomorphic curves. But at their heart, they're really, they're really elliptic PDEs, and, and a lot, oftentimes the game then is to, to borrow ideas from complex geometry, algebraic geometry in particular, and port them over into, um, into this realm of, of symplectic geometry, where your complex structure becomes actually almost complex structure. And, and that's really a, the analysis of, of, uh, of, of PDEs and topology. And now I want to come back and, and address this, this point here, this star. Why do we impose this omega tame condition? See, the thing is that if you're studying these elliptic, these geometric elliptic PDEs, right, you want to think of these things as minimal services or harmonic maps, for instance, right, then you want to be able to do analysis. In particular, you want to say, you know, prove some sort of compactness theorem for these sorts of things. But in order to do a fair amount of analysis, say, in particular compactness, you need certain a priori metric bounds, metric bounds like a priori bounds on energy, a priori bounds on area, these sorts of quantities. But these are metric, which really have nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with symplectic geometry a priori. However, once you impose this tameness condition, this guarantees that, say, for instance, homology bounds for the class represented by a pseudo-holomorphic curve then end up giving you a priori bounds on area and energy. In other words, you can do a lot of analysis simply from topological bounds, a priori topological bounds. And so this is sort of the fundamental role that the symplectic form takes. But the, sort of the interesting thing is that in lots of the subsequent analysis, the symplectic form plays almost no role at all at least in terms of the analysis of pseudo-holomorphic curves. It plays this one incredibly important role and then seems to do nothing else. And this one incredible, incredibly important role is to give a priori metric bounds in terms of topological bounds, right? Okay. Well, it has nothing to do with ellipticity, right? Nope, nothing to do with ellipticity. I mean, once you satisfy, I mean, once you have an almost complex structure defined, right, you still have, you have a Fredholm problem, everything goes through. Um, uh, this is sort of the weakest condition, this sort of tameness condition. The other is a com c compatibility condition, when in fact, uh, you know, you put x and y here, and then this becomes a Romanian metric. Uh, in that case, you're in sort of an almost Kähler category, and, and that's, con that's often convenient uh, uh, sometimes. There's uh, a number of things which are simplified, but everything that I'm aware of um, so far has some sort of an analog if we r reduce it to sort of the tame condition, right? I mean, in particular, pseudo, if you're working in the almost Kähler, yeah, if you're working in the almost Kähler category, then the image of a pseudo-holomorphic curve becomes actually a minimal surface. If you're working in the tame condition, it's not a min it's no longer a minimal surface, but it satisfies an inhomogeneous mean curvature equation. So there's lots of sort of parallels. It just means you have to work a bit harder. Yeah, and your, uniformly as long as you uh, write down your local coordinates properly, right? I mean, it, you know, if you, it's possible to, to, to localize the problem in a really poor way in which you lose that, but, but, uh, but yes, uh, essentially it becomes uniformly elliptic. Um, in particular, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to be working in sort of a sufficiently small domain in, in, uh, in both the target and the image, but you localize and then you have the, the, the uh, uniform ellipticity condition, for sure. And, and, and is the PDE in, in what geometry? Uh, so... Well, when you, when you localize the problem, you have holomorphic coordinates, uh, you know, z equals s plus i t. And then 
and then it's, it's, it's coordinates then, uh, these are coordinates on sigma. And then you take a, a, a local coordinate chart in the target, and then, uh, and then you can, yeah, then you write down the PDE. So you have, you know, U of ST, right, this takes values in, in general R2N, but, you know, R4 in our case, for instance, where you have an almost complex structure now defined in the target, right, P is in R2N, and then if you write this thing down locally, it should satisfy the following equation, uh, U of ST partial with respect to S plus J of U S T times U T, which depends on U T, equals zero. Oh, so it's just like a Cauchy-Riemann equation? It is, a, it is the Cauchy-Riemann equation. No, the tameness has nothing to do with ellipticity. Tameness does one important does one important thing, which is that, which is that, it guarantees that topological bounds of your curve, right? Say the homology class that it represents puts an a priori area bound or energy bound on your curve. Right? So sort of metric bounds are given to you by topological bounds. That's the only role that the symplectic form plays. That's it. Otherwise, yeah, elliptic regularity, Fredholm theory. Uh, everything else can be done without that assumption. But you lose, you lose the compactness theorem. Um, well, you could talk about, well, okay, so if I don't have a symplectic, if I don't have a symplectic form, then the first thing that I'm going to do is, to, is I'm going to define, um, well, right, so if you give me any Riemannian metric plus my almost complex structure, then this pair will yield another Riemannian uh, metric together with the same almost complex structure so that this almost complex structure ends up being an isometry with respect to this new metric, right? And then I can, cons I can define energy, say, for instance, in terms of, of, of this metric on the target and on the domain, I mean, uh, say, uh, some sort of uh, constant curvature metric. Whatever sure. I mean, but I, I mean, in essence, that, I mean, in essence, um, yeah, in some sense, your, your energy bounds then all end up being equivalent, I think. Yes, absolutely. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful about this, but there's a result by Mikhailov and White, which basically says that, uh, well, let's see, I think the best way to sort of phrase it is that if you take like a, if, you, if you're at a point, well, I guess there's two ways to do it. You have Mikhailov and White, White's result, which essentially says that, um, which essentially says that if you take, if you're, if you're at a singularity and you take a Taylor expansion, then the lowest order terms end up being actually like a holomorphic polynomial, right? And then it's also, then there's, a, uh, there's another result uh, which I care for less, but is probably more prevalently used, which is, a, which is the um, Carlin, Carlin similarity principle, which sort of gives you a, it's sort of like a change of coordinates, which uh, sort of in the target, which depends upon points in your domain, which in some sense transforms your curve, the image of your curve into um, a holomorphic, uh, a holomorphic submanifold, right? And so then again, you have this so something similar. Right? It, it just it depends a little bit on what, what what you need to get out of this. But yes, there's two approaches to tell you that essentially your singularities are are no more complicated than those in in, in uh, the algebraic case. All right. So now I want to tell you one of the important results that comes out of that paper. This is probably a bad place to write it, so I think I'll write it over here. This is a theorem due to Gromov in his 85 paper, which basically says, given an omega tame almost complex structure on CP2 and uh, distinct points P and Q in CP2, there exists a unique pseudo holomorphic sphere with degree one passing through. P and Q. So now, this will turn out later to be actually a, a rather useful result. So, if I if you if I give you 
R2, when I give you two points in R2, there exists a, a unique straight line which passes through those two points. If I give you C2 in two points, there exists a, a straight, there exists a complex line, a unique complex line which passes through those two points. If we extend C2 to CP2, then if I give you two points, there exists a unique uh, CP1 which passes through those two points of degree one. And Gromov's result then generalizes this to the case where your complex structure is now an almost complex structure. But you do need, you do in fact need this tameness condition. It's also interesting to note that if you try and, if you try and bump this up, this result up, and say, well, what happens if we take two to be three or four or higher, this result actually fails. You lose uniqueness, right? which is somewhat unfortunate. Uh, so yes, yeah, so with a Fubini study metric on CP2, yeah. But but the complex, but your almost complex structure, structure. This is allowed to, to, to as long as it's tame, right? This is the result. Okay. Good, good. All right. So right. So on the left here, we're talking about you know symplectic manifolds, pseudo holomorphic curves, and on the right, we're still trying to connect this to the moon, which is some sort of dynamical system. So we want to try and con connect symplectic geometry to dynamical systems. And of course, this is actually, this is sort of, in many ways, this is the roots of symplectic geometry is uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. But since I want to connect Gromov uh, to a dynamical system, essentially, although it's not directly relevant, uh, it's really important to mention the contributions of Floor, who made, well, he did a lot of beautiful mathematics. And, and uh, one of the um, results of that is, is the observation that, that uh, Pseudo-holomorphic curves, in particular floor trajectories, uh, are useful for studying Hamiltonian dynamical systems. Now, I said I, I tried to advertise this talk as sort of a general audience talk, so we should probably ask what's a Hamiltonian dynamical system. So if you have a symplectic manifold together with a map from your manifold into the real line, then this will actually yield a unique vector field. And it does this in the following manner. We simply say, well, we take omega and we input our Hamiltonian vector field. Omega is a two form. It's now one form if I, if I input uh, this vector field into the first factor. And we want to demand that this be minus the differential of h. Now, if you're not used to thinking of symplectic manifolds, and Hamiltonian systems, there's another sort of useful trick that you can do. So in particular, if we assume for simplicity that our symplectic form is actually given to us by looking at a Ramanian metric and then semi-composing with our almost complex structure, right? in this case, we're in the almost Kähler category, then our Hamiltonian vector field is precisely, well, you look at the gradient with respect to h, and we can take a gradient because we now are, we've assumed that we have a metric, and then we apply our almost complex structure. So this is, again, a Hamiltonian vector field in this special case that we're dealing, in a, uh, dealing with a, an almost um, uh, an almost Hermitian manifold, which actually, this is almost Kähler manifold, which actually ends up being the case um, fairly often. Uh, good, so now we have sort of Hamiltonian dynamics. And I guess I should sort of, I guess I should point out a couple of things. Uh, I should point out a couple of things about Hamiltonian vector fields. So in particular, you can see from this description here, if you're willing to tinker with it a little bit, that the Hamiltonian vector field ends up being tangent to level sets of your Hamiltonian. And it also, pres its flow preserves the symplectic form, and its flow also preserves the volume form. Uh, so you have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of structure here um, coming from Hamiltonian dynamics and symplectic manifolds, well, Hamiltonian dynamics. So this raises sort of a natural question, which is, you know, is this problem here a Hamiltonian dynamical system? So now there's a classical result. And I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure when this was sort of discovered, um, which roughly says yes. I'll fix that in just a second, right? So the classical result says yes, but we have to move from our inertial frame to uh, a rotating frame. So the point is we take a time-dependent change of coordinates, 
which takes the Earth to 0 and the Moon to 1. And we're thinking of these as being in, um, let's see, we're thinking of these as being in the complex plane, which is isomorphic to R2. And if I really want to be careful, I'll even put a Q down here because Q is going to be position space and P is going to be momentum. Right? And in this case here, after we take this time dependent change of coordinates, um, the trajectories of our massless particle are integral curves of a time independent Hamiltonian vector field. And in fact, we can write it down. So let's see. Again, with, with Q position and P momentum, and we're thinking of these as being complex variables just because it's sort of notationally convenient. It doesn't represent anything else more important than that. We can write down the Hamiltonian as, well, all points in position space, except, uh, except for at the Earth and Moon, times all possible momentums, this is real valued. And the Hamiltonian is given as, let's see, let's try and, no, this is probably OK. H of QP is equal to 1 half norm P minus I Q minus mu squared minus mu, let's see, Q minus mu squared minus 1 minus mu over norm Q minus mu over norm 1 minus yeah, that's right, 1 minus q, where mu is this mass ratio, which is given by the mass of the moon divided by the mass of the Earth plus the mass of the moon. And this ends up being a number between 0 and 1. See, we want to be able to do dynamics, but we don't want to actually have to know what the mass of the Earth and the moon is. And so you get around this by essentially considering just the mass ratio. Right, this number between 0 and 1. You know, in particular, when this number is 0, that means the mass of the, of the moon is, is, is 0. So we're thinking of it as just sort of a, a massless particle uh, orbiting the Earth. And if the mass ratio is 1, then we assume that actually the mass of the Earth is 0. Right? And all you know, your moon is the, it contains uh, the entire mass of the problem. So this ends up being our Hamiltonian. And I'm sorry? Uh, um, let's see. I mean, so so we've changed we've changed coordinates we've changed coordinates so that um, 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 the Earth and the Moon are stationary. So P and Q are sort of meant to represent the position and the momentum in uh, in this new change of coordinates, right? So does that answer your? I mean, okay. So maybe momentum is probably the wrong word since it's massless, right? So essentially velocity. Um, no. And where is the Coriolis curve? I'm sorry? Where is the Coriolis curve? So the Coriolis term is, it's, it's a mixture written this way. So you have one contribution uh, from this term right here and then another contribution here. Otherwise, I mean, you just have this sort of, otherwise you just have the potential sort of associated to the, your two stationary points and then you have a momentum squared basically, right? So that's where the Coriolis, Coriolis term shows up. I'm sorry? Is it a minor curve or was it an actual Oh, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know. I, I, um, yeah, that's, that's, 
that's a good question. I don't know if it's if it, how how miraculous it was that this is. I mean, to me, looking when I first started studying this problem, this struck me as a miracle, right? Absolutely a miracle that somehow we have this sort of everything sort of rotating. We take a rotating change of variables, and then suddenly everything becomes a time independent Hamiltonian system. It did it did certainly seem miraculous to me. Um, uh, but then yeah, I just take it and run with it. So I, I didn't I didn't spend enough time thinking about how how miraculous this uh, this result was. Okay. Uh, I would, I don't know, I haven't thought about it, um, but what I would expect is that you, sh I would, I would expect that you would get a Hamiltonian system, but it, it's not going to be time uh, independent anymore. I mean, in particular, we, we do have this, we do have this, this circular condition, right? If you remove the circular condition and just allow these things to be ellipses, now even in, in even in, after a rotating change of, uh, of coordinates, it's going to look like uh, your, 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 your masses are bouncing back and forth, and so I certainly wouldn't expect it to be a time dependent anymore. But it still should be, I would still expect it to be, um, but I, my intuition is that it's Hamiltonian, but I really don't know. So I'm, I'm sort of going on a limb there for the moment. Any other questions? Well, is the symplectic structure Yes, yes. So the symplectic structure is the standard one, uh, dq dp, or dp dq. For this setup, yes. Um, well, it sort of depends. I think that sort of the purpose of this talk and the strand of my research is, is, to, is to work in the circular case where it's sort of clear that these, as it turns out, you can take a sort of another change of variables in these hypersurfaces, uh, sort of the regularized energy surfaces end up being contact type, which ends up being really useful for, 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 for studying with pseudo-holomorphic curves. Now, once, you, but it's a natural question to sort of say, okay, what happens when we sort of extend a bit further, right? And what I would say is that before before I start asking the question that maybe the two massive primaries uh, orbit each other around on ellipses, I think actually a more interesting question would be to ask if we remove the planar condition. And then we allow, our, we, we allow our, ourselves to have a particle which doesn't live in the same plane. And this is actually really important to sort of the dynamical systems folks because, uh, because in practice, you know, it's, it's certainly, it's, it's nice to know how to put a satellite, say, um, uh, um, that's orbiting the Earth into orbit around the moon in a plane, in, in sort of a planar position, but that's kind of restrictive, right? I mean, for instance, you'd like it to orbit along some other plane, in the, you know, around the moon, for instance. And so from an applicability uh, standpoint, I think it makes more sense to, before one removes the circular condition, to remove the planar condition. Um, and uh, that's, I have some ideas in that direction, but uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't pushed them yet. Well, it depends on sort of applications. I think, uh, so, yeah, so the answer is sort of, uh, the, answer is, uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, I'm, I, I, for me, I like to think sort of simply, so for me, it's, uh, it's the Earth-Moon system and sort of nothing else exists. Uh, there have been applications sort of, sort of very close to these ideas where the, 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 the sun did play a really important role. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there's other systems. I think another, uh, another standard system to consider, I think, is like uh, the sun and Jupiter, say, for instance, and then consider like the, the moons uh, orbiting around Jupiter, for instance. This is sort of another interesting sort of problem. Um, but, uh, but not in this setup, but in sort of a, a slight generalization of this setup, you could consider the sun, and that was sort of very useful for studying, I think, uh, Bel Bruno used uh, the sun and this sort of three-body type problem to, uh, to put a satellite, sort of a, a half-dead satellite, um, I think it was Hagamoro, uh, that was orbiting around the Earth into uh, orbit around the, the, the moon. And so it was, yeah, ended up saving, you know, $100 million for the, from the Japanese uh, space program because he was able to do this. So, so yes, there are some times when these subtle changes are, are incredibly important. But mathematically, for what I want to do here, no, I, I just sort of assume the sun doesn't exist if I want to work in the Earth-Moon system. Okay, so where are we now? Four, moon, good. Good, good, good. Okay, so now what I would like to do is, is say, okay, we have our Hamiltonian. We have our Hamiltonian, and we can make some observations. And these are really just fairly simple observations um, that one can make, essentially, by, by doing nothing more than tinkering around with the, with, with the Hamiltonian here. But the observation is that if I'm on, if my trajectory is on some, some level set of my Hamiltonian, which is very negative, then the particle 
is trapped near the Earth, the Moon, or infinity. So I can draw a picture. We have here's the Earth, and here's the Moon. And the idea is that if, if, the, if you're on an energy level which is very, very negative, then your particle is sort of trapped near the Earth. I mean, this kind of makes sense, right? I mean, I put a satellite up, but I don't give it too much energy. It's going to stay near the Earth. Uh, but if it starts near the Moon, then it's going to stay near the Moon. And if it starts sort of away from the Earth and Moon, it stays away from the Earth and the Moon. Uh, yes, so there is a, so for instance, if you look at, if I look at very negative energy levels, then there ends up being an, an, energy, an energy level which is contained in a neighborhood of the Earth, a neighborhood of the Moon, and another connected component which is sort of near infinity. So there are three. But for my interests, I, I don't care about the one in infinity like at all, right? I'm just, that I'm sort of not interested in. Because, and, and let me explain why. If you, if you move up your energy levels bit by bit, uh, then what ends up happening is you, you end up with, in fact, these sort of hills regions where your, where your, where your particle can be. And they touch. I mean, you have, you have another one coming in, sort of coming in from infinity, but again, I sort of want to disregard that. And what happens is, as you increase your, your energy levels up higher and higher and higher, eventually these two basins, these two hills regions, actually connect at a single point, which we call the first Lagrange point. And this is a critical point of your Hamiltonian, and or corresponds to a critical point of your Hamiltonian. And, uh, and then suddenly it's going to be the case that your, that your particle can travel Right? Particles can travel from, say, a neighborhood of the Earth into a neighborhood of the Moon. Now, this is where I think all the interesting, well, all, not all the interesting dynamics, but a lot of the interesting dynamics occurs, right? Precisely for, let's say, well, for practical reasons, because one can prove some theorems about this, but also from, practical, uh, from a practical standpoint of, of, uh, of, of um, celestial mechanics, right? Because in these regions, we're interested in satellites which say only orbit the Earth, or only orbit the, the, the Moon, or orbit the Earth for a while and then transition and then orbit the Moon for a while, right? So, right, and this is exactly, I mean, this is the vast majority of what our space program does, right? It puts satellites into orbit either around the Earth or the Moon, um, uh, yeah, essentially around either the Earth or the Moon. It's also sort of interesting to note that, that sort of classically, um, the way one would put something into satellite, it, it put a satellite into orbit around the moon was really, really energy inefficient. I mean, basically, you'd put it into orbit around the Earth, and then you'd slam on the gas so that essentially your trajectory is a straight line. And once it gets to the right point, uh, sort of in what you want the trajectory to be around the moon, you slam on the brakes. And then this thing sort of slows down and then, and, and, and then is trapped into a periodic orbit. This is called a Hohmann transfer, and it's extremely energy inefficient and was used throughout, well, throughout the 80s and probably half the 90s. And you know, it's expensive to get stuff into, it's expensive, it's really expensive to get stuff into space. And so what you'd really like to do instead is, is find a way to get up to an energy level so that you could just sort of coast in between two orbits, right? That's really sort of the, the, the goal that, that one would like to be able to do. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, this Lagrange point is, is a critical point of your Hamiltonian. So in this rotating reference frame, it's a, it's, it's a it, yeah, it's sort of uh, unstable, but it's, it is this point where, where your particle would appear to be at rest. After you move slightly above the first Lagrange point, well, a couple things sort of appear. If you're in the planar case, then you end up with a Lyapunov orbit. It's sort of, it, it's just sort of, uh, it's sort of, yeah, you end up with a Lyapunov orbit, which just sort of um, orbits around this point, essentially. And then, uh, and then if you're in the non-planar case, you also get a halo orbit sort of nearby. Um, Right, so let's see, where are we? Good, five, six, ah, okay. So this is what we'd like to sort of, this is what we'd like to study. Um, but we have sort of a bit of a problem. So we're, we're, we want to transition back to pseudo-holomorphic curves in a minute. But we have this problem, which is that, um, which is that uh, energy levels are not compact, right? In particular, I mean, essentially what's going on here is that at, ener at any energy level, say even below the first Lagrange point near the Earth or, or the Moon, your particle could crash into the planet. We have this, we have this non-compactness issue that sort of has to be dealt with. So now, Moser fixed this problem, which we call sort of regularization. <coughs> 
So he does the following. This is pretty cool. So I like this diagram. All right. He says, OK, let's consider some level set. And we're assuming we're below the first Lagrange point, And essentially, we have a connected component of, of say, around the Earth, say, for instance. Right? So we're looking at an energy level set. And we have this connected component, which is the, uh, this uh, connected component of this energy level that's sort of trapped near the Earth. Right? And then what you can do is say, OK, well, look, this lives as a subset of R4. But R4 can be thought of as the cotangent bundle of R2 to get equipped with sort of the standard d, p, h, d, q with a standard symplectic form. But R2, we can stereographic project and put, it in, and, and put it into S2. So we have this map coming from stereographic projection into the cotangent bundle of S2 with, in fact, the standard symplectic form. And in fact, this, is, this map is symplectic. And since this map is symplectic, and our uh, connected component of our energy surface is, is, is a subset of here, we can then consider psi of our energy surface, right? And this will be contained in here. But as it turns out, this actually, ah, right. And then what we can do is we can, take the image of our hypersurface and just look at the setwise closure, just the setwise closure. And it turns out that this is, in fact, a hypersurface of a smooth function. In fact, a regular, I mean, it's a regular level set of a smooth function. And furthermore, it's diffeomorphic to RP3. So now, this is Moser regularization. So, so now we have this regularized problem where after regularization, our, our level sets below, slightly below the first, or below the first Lagrange point are, in fact, um, are in fact diffeomorphic to RP3. So G is a Hamiltonian on two sides? Yes, G is a Hamiltonian. G would be a Hamiltonian on the cotangent bundle of the sphere. Um, I'm sorry. It's not a collision between the Earth and the Moon because they're sort of in our, right. It's, it's just a collision with, say, a particle and one of the massive primaries. And we're working below the first Lagrange point, so there's really only one possible sort of collision. Well, there's one possible collision point, but there's different, I believe there's different momenta at which this, uh, th this could occur, right? And so when you actually look at sort of the set of points, so if you look at the, the closure and then sort of remove the other points, this, in fact, ends up being uh, a copy of S1. And <coughs> furthermore, which is sort of interesting, as it turns out, um, this hypersurface, this is a theorem in just a second, ends up being, this hypersurface here ends up being contact type. And in fact, what you, what the, the, the circle that you glue in is actually the Gendrian, which is sort of also, I, I think, anyway, sort of rather interesting. Um, Which is exactly why, if you think about this sort of limiting problem, it's exactly why this, this, this hard collision bounce actually, you, you can heuristically can see it as it, it makes sense as a good approximation to the problem. And appropriately realized, it becomes actually smooth. And so the point is that, in fact, your Hamiltonian vector field actually in this regularized problem smoothly extends. So now I need somewhere to. Pardon? No, it is Hamiltonian. It still remains Hamiltonian. Yes, the point is that. The point, is that, uh, the point is that there's a symplectic form on the cotangent bundle of S2, and this, Im this embedding is, in fact, symplectic. And so this ends up being a hypersurface in a symplectic manifold, which is the level set of a regular function, of a smooth function. And so it ends up being, um, so it ends up having a Hamiltonian vector field, which is, well, it might not be on the nose equal to sort of the push forward from, uh, from, from our case, but it's, it, it would agree up to sort of conformal multiple. Um, let me think. So, do, 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 the point should be that the point should be that um, the point should be. It's a good question. <laughs> 
if I remember, if I remember correctly, uh, that, that point ends up getting blown up. Right? That, sort of that, that locus ends up getting blown up into sort of a collection of at least S1s on, a, on an S1 at least for a given energy level. Um, there's a subtlety here, though, that I think that I think the point is that this Hamiltonian function depends upon your choice of energy level. So you change the Hamiltonian function dependent upon the energy level, right? So that's sort of a, a, a subtle point. Good. Any other questions? Okay. So now we have, uh, let's see, I think I can erase this. So now we have a theorem due to Albers, Fraunfelder, uh, Van Cort, and Gabriel Paternine, which essentially says the following. It essentially says that the regularized energy levels below the first Lagrange point are contact type and so are the regularized energy levels slightly above L1, and the latter hmm, are diffeomorphic to RP3 next sum RP3. All right. Right. So you have a so there's a there's a regularization procedure I think for a, a much larger range of uh, for a much larger range of um, energy levels. In particular, you can do the regularization above the first level, but it's not it's not sort of the same thing. You then sort of have to localize the problem a bit. Right. 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 I mean, so yes. So you, so but well, the regularization though is just a means of sort of, uh, of of sort of smoothing out the problem of 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 your satellite crashing into a planet. So regularization, I think, holds it at many different uh, energy levels, but only s uh, but only slightly above the first Lagrange point uh, is it going to be the case that those ener those regularized energy levels are actually contact type and diffeomorphic to the connect sum of two R two copies of RP three. So that's sort of the result. So so now I have to tell you a small amount of contact geometry. So I should, should probably say that a hypersurface in, if you, don't know, if you don't know any contact geometry, then for the most part it's sort of sufficient to say that, well, if something is of, if, if a level set is of contact type, then it's a particularly special type of, of level set in a Hamilton, of a Hamiltonian. Right? It's, it's, it's particularly special. But from a contact geometry perspective, uh, there's a lot of structure there that you can exploit in order to make use of pseudo-holomorphic curves. So, so now contact geometry existed long before Hofer, but in 93, uh, he introduced pseudo-holomorphic curves and simplectizations of contact manifolds. So we should probably say, okay, let's start with a three-manifold N together with a one-form um, lambda, satisfy satisfying the property that lambda wedge d lambda is a volume form. So in this, in this case, we call lambda the contact form. And uh, we call the kernel of lambda, which we define to be C, the contact structure. Right? Um, and in particular, then, this contact form uniquely determines a vector field, x of lambda, which is the ray vector field which is defined by d lambda interior product with x lambda is 0, and lambda applied to x lambda is 1. Now again, if you're not familiar with ray, sort of ray dynamics, so this would be a ray vector field, 
or contact geometry, then the important thing to remember is that, um, is that essentially your Hamiltonian vector field up to, say, conformal multiple, positive conformal multiple, is essentially just your Rabe vector field. Right? So we're going to be interested in Rabe dynamics rather than Hamiltonian dynamics, at least when we're studying contact manifolds. Okay. So now, of course, this was known before Hofer. So what's Helmut do? He says, consider r cross n. So now, four-dimensional manifold. And we can put an almost complex structure. So we'll say that the almost complex structure is going to be r invariant. It's going to take the symplectization vector field to the Rabe vector field. And it's going to map the contact structure to itself. And if I really want to be careful, we should uh, note that the contact, let's see, the d lambda restricted to the contact form is a symplectic form, right? And we would want the almost complex structure then to be um, compatible with the symplectic form. Okay. So we should probably put on this condition as well. But then you can consider pseudo-holomorphic maps. Well, you'd like to consider pseudo-holomorphic maps from closed Riemann surfaces into the symplectization. But that's no good. These all end up being constant maps, sort of a Stokes theorem sort of argument. So what you have to do is consider punctured Riemann surfaces. So you, 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 you remove a finite number of points. And then he considers a particular class of finite energy curves. So the finite energy condition I don't want to write down. It essentially says that the map u ends up being proper and that the d lambda integral is finite. Right? Now, if you do this, something interesting happens. You can look at the image of a pseudo-holomorphic curve, in particular one of these finite energy pseudo-holomorphic curves. And so if I try and draw this, Here we, think of, here we think of our contact manifold n. We have the symplectization direction r. The image of your pseudo-holomorphic curve, well, then it might look something like, say, this, for instance. It has sort of a cylindrical end, uh, sort of at positive infinity, a cylindrical end, and minus infinity. So to describe this, we should make the following observation, which is that if I have a Rabe vector field, which I'm essentially thinking of as like a Hamiltonian vector field, if I have a periodic orbit, then I have a loop inside my contact manifold or a level set of a Hamiltonian. Now, if it, right, so now I have a closed loop. The condition that J is R invariant together with the fact that the symplectization direction gets mapped to the Rabe direction says that if I look at R across this S1, right, I end up getting a pseudo-holomorphic curve. Right? Essentially, a pseudo-holomorphic curve over a, uh, sort of over a periodic orbit. And the point is that this finite energy condition will guarantee that in positive infinity and negative infinity, your pseudo-holomorphic curves are always going to be asymptotic, in fact, exponentially asymptotic with all derivatives, to sort of graphs, small, you know, collapsingly small graphs over these orbit cylinders. And so the observation then, well, I'll just sort of say it, the observation is that finding these finite energy pseudo-holomorphic curves in symplectization finds periodic orbits of the Rabe vector field. So then, the question sort of becomes, well, how do you find such pseudo-holomorphic curves? So let me see. Now, at this point, we can go back to Gromov. I might even I have it on the board still. I think I just, I might have just erased it. That's sad. So, remember, Gromov had this result which sort of says, look, if you're working in CP2, as long as you have a tame almost complex structure, give me two distinct points, there's a unique degree one sphere passing through those two points for any omega tame almost complex structure. So, now look, here's sort of an idea. And this idea, this is really sort of the, this is the core idea of probably, the, uh, let's see, Hofer and Vizotsky and Zander's 2003 paper on uh, finite energy foliations. Uh, it also arguably is, is uh, 
a key idea in their 98 paper on uh, dynamically convex, or no, strictly convex hypersurfaces in R4. <coughs> so the idea is the following. On one hand, we have something like R4, and that's a poor picture. Here's R4, and then maybe I'll do something like this, right? So this is meant to be a um, N, which is an embedded hypersurface, diffeomorphic to S3, which bounds a strongly convex domain. Now, <coughs> It's trivial, and it's fairly trivial once you have the problem set up to see that this actually is contact type. But then what they do is they say, well, look, R4, we can think of as just C2, which sits inside CP2. And so now I can draw CP2 in the following manner, which probably looks a little bit strange. So here's CP2. Here's CP1 at infinity, if you will. And then... Here's N, which is diffeomorphic to S3. And so then what happens is Gromov, uh, sorry, Gromov says if you pick any point, say fix a point at, at, uh, at infinity and you fix any other point, and there exists a unique pseudo-holomorphic sphere, degree one, passing through those two points. So modulo, say, what happens at infinity, you can use those pseudo-holomorphic curves to, to foliate some region in between here. And so then you then take this idea together with an idea uh, called coming from gauge theory, which is stretching the neck, where essentially, well, you can think of degenerating your almost complex structure in this, along this, sort of in a neighborhood of this hypersurface in a rather careful way, which conformally looks like you're taking, the, you're taking your symplectic manifold and stretching it into pieces. And as you stretch, you can prove a compactness theorem, where inside this, this interval cross S3, right, your interval cross 3 ends up getting sort of longer and longer and longer until it looks like R cross S3. And then you have the symplectization of a contact manifold. And then proving an appropriate compactness theorem gives rise to precisely these finite energy pseudo-holomorphic curves in, R, in the symplectization of S3. In particular, if it were the case that your S3 bounded a strongly convex domain, then all your pseudo-holomorphic curves, with the exception of one, end up being asymptotic to the same periodic orbit. Furthermore, their projection to the contact manifold, each one of them is, ends up being a global disk-like surface of section. So this, a global disk-like surface of section. So the point is that, right, we have this contact three manifold, which we're thinking of as just S3, with this ray vector field on it, right? And we, then we had this, we looked at R cross S3, and we have this, this result from, from, from Gromov together with Helmut and Vizotsky and Zander, which basically say we can use this to construct a bunch of pseudo-holomorphic curves in the symplectization. We project them down to the contact manifold, and now they, each one looks like a disk with its boundary on a closed ray orbit. Furthermore, the ray vector field, which is essentially the Hamiltonian vector field that we're interested in, is transverse to the interior of that disk and intersects that disk both in forward time and backward time. This is the definition of a global disk-like surface of section. So, so now, now, global disk-like surfaces of section restrict the dynamics a lot. In particular, they reduce a problem from they reduce a problem, uh, which is, say, a three-dimensional continuous dynamical system to a two-dimensional discrete one. And Franks has an important result, which says, look, if this map right, of the disk to itself is area preserving, then you have either one or infinitely many periodic points, which then lift then to one or infinitely many uh, ray orbits, together with a binding, gives you two or infinitely many. Right? And as it turns out, so I can just sort of say in words here since I'm out of time, that one of the results that I proved, together with Albers, Fraunfelder, Van Cort, and Helmut, is that right, we've essentially reduced the regularized uh, planar circular restricted three-body problem to rave dynamics on RP3. But what we show is that, in fact, for a large range of mass ratios and energy levels below the first Lagrange point, that that, that, that that dynamical system actually lifts to S3 and admits a strong contact embedding into R4 which bounds, a, which bounds a strongly convex domain. And the conclusion then is that for a large range of mass ratios and energy levels, we actually prove the existence of two or infinitely many periodic orbits of the planar circular restricted three-body problem.
And, and essentially, as I said at the beginning, the very end of my talk is essentially where my research starts, right? And there's a number of interesting things that happen. In particular, we have numerical evidence to suggest that you can actually run this argument all the way up to the first Lagrange point, which, is all, which would be really, really interesting, I think. And it looks to be like that's the case. That, that is to say that you can use pseudo-holomorphic curves to find global disk-like surfaces of section all the way up to the first Lagrange point. And then we remember, after you pass the first Lagrange point, this looks like a connect sum of two contact manifolds. Right? Now, and Richard Seifring and I have shown that if you give me two contact manifolds, each with a stable finite energy foliation, which is a structure which sort of gives rise to these global disk-like surfaces of section, that you can take these stable finite energy foliations and actually lift them above, say, uh, a connect sum operation and end up with something which, again, is a finite energy foliation. And this would be really, really cool because in this particular problem, this would provide some structure, actually a lot of structure, uh, into the dynamical system above the first Lagrange point where classical methods sort of quickly fail quite dramatically. Um, right, okay, and I think I'll go ahead and end there. Sorry for running over.